Welcome to Around the Empire. I'm your host, Joanne Leon. Around the Empire podcast is listener-supported independent media. Pitch in if you can, patreon.com slash around the empire or paypal.me slash around the empire pod. Also, please like, share, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Today, we speak to Yash Levine, and we talk about his new series on Substack titled Immigrants as a Weapon. Yash refers to this as an investigative newsletter about, quote, weaponized immigrants, oligarchs, and the twisted politics of American power, unquote. He refers to himself as a Soviet immigrant living in an era of American decline, and it speaks for itself as to why his perspective is so perfect for this fascinating topic. At the end of the discussion, there's an extra segment on surveillance and contact tracing, and it's a separate bonus extra for patrons titled Episode 165 Extra, Surveillance and Contact Tracing in the Pandemic Era. Yash Levine is an investigative journalist and author. He's born in Leningrad, and he grew up in San Francisco and just moved back to California. He has reported from all over the world with a focus on America and the former Soviet Union. He's the author of the book, Surveillance Valley, The Secret Military History of the Internet, a book about the forgotten counterinsurgency origins of the internet. Yasha Levine's here, speaking to us from California. Hello, Yasha. Welcome to Around the Empire. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, thanks for having me. For people who maybe are not familiar with your work, just give us a little bit of a background on uh, who you are and uh, whatever it is that you want to sort of synthesize into a few minutes about yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, hard well, to do. I, yeah, well, yeah, I'm, my name is uh, Yasha Levine. I'm a, I guess I'm an investigative journalist. Although you know, uh, it's a strange, uh, it's a strange tag uh, because I don't know. I mean, journalism is kind of um, journalism is kind of dead in, in our culture, and so uh, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm, I mean, I don't like I do. You know, it's so I'm like an independent in, investigative journalist, or I'm a, you know, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a newsletter writer, or a blogger, or a or a you know amateur historian, or a, you know, I don't know, I don't know what you want to call all these things. Um, I you know may, um, dabble in some documentary stuff as well, but I, I'm I'm for the most part I'm a I'm a like yeah I'm a somewhere between a a um, an independent uh, journalist and uh, historian I guess um, and my, my my interest uh, is in uh, like a confluence of forces I uh, uh, prim- primarily the, the the power of the oligarchy and the way that the American Empire um, uh, flexes its its power uh, and uh, the modes of, of power in society. You know, I came from this, I was born in the Soviet Union. And so I came to the States when I was very little, like when I was nine. Um, and so I've sort of had this always, this dual um, identity. Um, part of me comes from this, you know, non-existent uh, country, uh, right? The, the Soviet Union. Uh, part of me is this sort of strange American creation. Uh, and it's sort of this hybrid creature it's with with one foot in in each of the cultures, and so I'm I'm of course drawn to um, the interplay of that, you know, the the immigrant experience um, and the way that um, I don't know, just the way that identity and and all these things are crafted in in, in this mixture of power and empire and, and geopolitical struggle. I mean, you know, so it's, it's it, it, there's there's a lot of things that I'm interested in. Um, but if if I were to take a like a kind of a strand that goes through a lot through much of it, it's um, a hidden power, you know, a hidden sort of politics and uh, the politics of power. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it uh, because I go through, you know, like I'm I'm as equally as interested in in the in the local politics of uh, my adopted home state, which is California, um, and the way that the power structures are here. For instance, one of my one of my interests is in in tracing the the the, the way that uh, the politics of water uh, works in California, because California is so extremely, I mean, water is so extremely important in California. No one really knows how it works, who controls it. Um, but you know, water has essentially been privatized by a handful of small um, these uh, a small group of of really powerful families, and no one really talks about it. And it was a discovery for me because you know, coming to California, I had this idealistic view of this place as a you know, as a beacon of liberal kind of progressivism, and to, for me to find out that actually 
the core of the state and the, 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 the one of the key power centers of this of this of the state is this really old school oligarchy that controls something as basic as water. You know, I mean, you have like one family that controls more water than 10 million people use in a year. You know, just wow. this is almost unknown to most people, you know, uh, and they use that water, of course, to enrich themselves and to. Um, so I go from that all the way to geopolitics, you know, to the, 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 the conflict between uh, America and the former Soviet Union and all the various little sort of geopolitical struggles on the periphery of the former Soviet Union and in the, the former Soviet Union itself in Russia. And so, you know, I worked as a journalist in Russia for a while. Um, so I've, got, I've gone back and forth. So my, my interests kind of span quite a bit of quite a bit of space and time um um so yeah uh, it's a bit of a it's a mouthful maybe but that's that's the best i can do right now yeah but for for this particular topic that we're going to talk about tonight the the um weaponized immigrants series that you've been writing for mm -hmm. i don't know about six months now and uh, you're so uniquely positioned to to talk about that and when I found this situation, when I found the uh, the writing on weaponized uh, immigrants, one of the things for the audience that we're going to talk about is one of the chapters in his Substack is called Weaponizing Fascism for Democracy, the beginning, where Yasha goes back to World War II and sort of talks about the proxy forces that are used, not just fighters, but also all kinds of different people um, who are displaced and then who are sort of sucked up by the empire to use for their own benefit, probably unknowingly, I don't, I don't even know. But mm -hmm. the thing that made me so interested in this particular topic was that during the Ukraine Maidan, just to give you a little sense of what my my perspective was at that point, I knew really nothing about Ukraine. I knew one family who was from Ukraine, but they have been here so long and they are so American that, you know, other than like mailing jeans and sneakers back home, uh, you know, like I really didn't hear much about their homeland. So I didn't know anything about it. I was an, uh, you know, a, a, a left activist and I had already been sort of inclined to side with protesters and so I thought I was going into this thinking I was going to be on their side and then I started to see the thing evolve it was very hard to get any information sort of first-hand information from Ukraine in English language but I did find some people who were there and who were talking about it and who were um, not pro on. so I did get that perspective and I started seeing a lot of things myself, thinking, what, who, wait a minute, who are these people? Who are these protesters? I see a lot of normal people, but then I see these little uh, sort of combat units, which I had never seen before. And they're like building trebuchets out in the square. <clears throat> and then I went, you know, I saw Confederate flags. It's like, wait a minute. And then mm -hmm. some of the leaders, commandants and so on of the Maidan, you know, were openly using Nazi symbols. They weren't even neo-Nazis. They were like real Nazis. And yeah. what I couldn't understand, though, is that there were also, let's say, um, some people from Israel who were sent over to help the Maidan. They, there were a lot of different foreign fighters who, came, who went over to join them and to help them and whatever they were doing. And it seemed like the Ukraine, I would, I would thought like the rabbis and things would be really worried and up and up against this and they weren't. And I was completely confused by the whole thing. So yeah. I've learned a whole lot more about that situation over time to where I've come to sympathize more with the separatists, at least mm. probably not yeah. their politics, probably not, but just like I, I started to understand I, I certainly wouldn't be a fan of uh, Yanukovych. I probably, you know, wouldn't vote for the same people they did. But the Maidan would, looked much more like a color revolution, and it didn't yeah. look like it was going to turn out well for the Ukrainian people. You know, what was going to happen to their country after this? You know, it looked like yeah. it was going to be uh, another smash and grab kind of thing. But it was even deeper than that. It was deeper than in other cases because, as I learned, 
there had been alliances with some of these um, fighting groups all the way back since World War II. So that's kind of like where my my head was uh-huh. uh, over that, you know, just really not not knowing what to think and then sort of coming along. But I still could never yeah. understand why there wasn't more worry about these um, fascists, right? Why, you know, yeah. why they were starting to rename streets after them and they were getting into the parliament. And here in the United States, everyone was fine with that for some reason or really just trying very much not to talk about it so yeah maybe we could uh well you know take that wherever wherever you like you the story that you tell is first of all it's like i told you before it's like a gut punch to to find out that this was happening when you are say you know in the 90s i was uh you know like an npr uh person very busy person i would get you know as much of my news as i could but it was from places like uh BBC and NPR and I don't know Bloomberg for some financial news and I thought I was informed now that's changed a lot since then but I thought yeah, that yeah. we were the good guys right I thought we were the good guys <laughs> and um I've I mean learned... the world is complicated yeah the world yeah. is complicated yeah. and uh, when you have when you when you have uh, you know America I know this makes it makes you know, Americans uncomfortable, and it actually makes a lot of, not just Americans uncomfortable, but a lot of people who look up to America still um, uncomfortable. You know, to call America an empire, um, and it, and you know, it does people do look do, do look at you askance now still. You know, if you if you if you refer to America as empire, but America is you know objectively an empire. It's a, it's a very powerful empire, and when you run an empire, um, an empire that's based on you know a, a pretty exploitative kind of um, business model. Right. Um, a colonial a kind of a, a new neo-colonial kind of business model. You know, you're going to have a lot of nasty stuff that you get into and have, you're going to have a lot of nasty groups that you support. You're, you're going to you might do some good things in the meantime, but you're also going to be doing a lot of bad things and and are going to get into alliances with uh, with groups that you know probably make a lot of your own uh, citizens and people who live in, 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 in the center of the empire uncomfortable and. But that's what you do as as it's it's kind of the it's just 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 the way the world works. And, um, you know, Ukraine is a, is a great example of that. You know, I mean, Ukraine, I mean, I, I, I mean, Ukraine is it's really difficult to unpack because people want a clear uh, morality tale of some kind. You want you want to have a clear cut good guy. You want to have a clear cut bad guy. And and um, you want to be, you know, figure know who to support. You know, is it the is it the is it the sort of the, the separatists in the east? Um or is it sort of the separatists uh, in the West, you know, uh, or in the sort of the Maidan protesters? Who, 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 who are the good guys here? And I know, they're, un- unfortunately, I mean, there's like shades of gray and there's overlapping kind of narratives. And it all depends on you know, who you are and where you look at, how you look at, at this conflict and from what perspective you look at, at this conflict. I mean, I think the best way to explain what's happening in Ukraine is that there's a series of wars and, str- and struggles layered on top of one another. Right. On the one hand. There's this cultural and sort of ethno-cultural uh, war or struggle um, it, within Ukraine that goes back um, centuries, really. I mean, and part of it is, has to do with the fact that Ukraine has never really been a whole country. You know, it's a very recent thing. It only happened. Um, well, you know, uh, I mean, Stalin basically made modern Ukraine. Um, he joined two, the two parts of Ukraine that had always been in actually different empires. Part of it was under the Russian Empire, the, the sort of the central and eastern part, and the western part of Ukraine was in the different, uh, different empires, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, Poland, the, sort of the, it was, so they were never joined together, but they were, there were sort of the two sides of Ukraine, and they actually have very different cultures, slightly different languages, a different religions even, um, and, and a different way of looking at, 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 at themselves. You know, one is sort of uh, the birthplace of the birthplace of, of you know, the, the Russian Empire, really, of Russian culture. It's the, you know, the Kievian Rus um, is, is, sort of, is you know, as seen as the birthplace of Russia, really, and, and the sort of Slavic culture. And then, um, you know, the West is this sort of, you know, almost like a province of Austria-Hungary, a, a, a province of other empires um, that were sort of, on the other side of this, so they're different. They're different, and so there's a there's a historical, a linguistic, cultural, religious kind of 
culture war really that that's been happening ever since the the two parts have been joined, right? And what does it mean to be Ukrainian? Does it mean to be Ukrainian to only speak Ukrainian? Uh, with what dialect? You know, is Russian uh, a Ukrainian language? You know, all, all these things. And so you have that, right? And you have the sort of various ideologies att attached to that. Then on the other, so th and that's sort of the historical component of it. Bringing that into into the into into the present, you have also have you know the country after the collapse of the Soviet Union has been, you know, it, it really never got out of the 90s mode of being. So in, in Russia, the, the 90s were really before Putin came to power and kind of centralized oligarchic power and right. um, and centralized it under, under a kind of a state oligarchic apparatus with kind of him being the mediator between all the different clans and a, a, a kind of, you know, I don't know what you'd call it, like some kind of oligarchic king or something, you know. Um, oh, uh, in, in Ukraine, the oligarchic, phase of post-Soviet development never went away. So the country has no politics outside of oligarchic politics. And so there's different clans shifting alliances of, of different oligarchs who own most, most of the country and all of its resources. Um, they are constantly fighting each other. Um, yeah. and, 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 they, and, and so they, between themselves, they use that culture that's on the ground as 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 ways of as, as ways of sort of as ways of uh, kind of um, to bolster their own power. And then the other, so you have the sort of the business fights that are constantly happening in in Ukraine. You have the cultural fights that are happening in Ukraine, and then you have the the geopolitical like layer on, on top of it, right? Which is that you have now uh, you know Russia kind of wants to keep Ukraine in its orbit. Um, uh, and sees it as a as a geopolitical you know kind of buffer between it and yeah, and NATO exactly. that that bounds it, and then America wants to peel as many uh, former Soviet republics away from Russia as possible, right? And so uh, for, for for as far as the American geopolitical strategy, it's been trying to foment these kind of color revolutions to basically peel away and put in put governments in power that are more friendly. You know, to a West, to the EU, to NATO, uh, to America, than they are to Russia, and so, so you have all these different layers, right? And they are all interacting with each other, um, and so that's why it's 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 really complicated because there isn't a there isn't like a clear divide of 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 of, of who the good guy is here. I mean, clearly, you know, from an, from an American, if you're an American, uh, and you're looking at this, I mean, clearly, what what America is doing there. You know, because you only have really power over your own society, over your own government. And what America is doing has been doing in Ukraine has been really, I mean, it's been, it's been criminal. I mean, it, it, to put it to, to put it honestly, is because it's been backing the most sort of reactionary, the most uh, nationalistic, the most far right elements within the Ukrainian culture wars. I mean, basically, uh, neo Nazis and fascists and sort of people who see themselves as the um, um, the inheritors of this long tradition of Ukrainian fascism um, that, was, that, that, you know, co-evolved with Italian fascism and, and German fascism um, came out of this sort of uh, 19th century nationalist, nationalist movements and were, you know, collaborated with, with, the Nazi, with Nazi Germany and, and fought for Nazi Ger Germany, with Nazi Germany against the Soviet Union during World War II. I mean, America's backing that side of the culture wars. Um, and it's been backing it in, as a way of, of sort of splitting Ukrainian society, and uh, the, my 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 Maidan is is a clear example of that. The revolution that that happened in uh, February 2014, it had been going on uh, for much of uh, sort of th the end of 2013. It was this big violent struggle that ended up with of the violent takeover of the government in um, in Kiev and the uh, I mean the it, a coup d'état essentially, you know, and the, the the Yanukovych, the sitting president, had to flee. And fled to Russia and uh, sit, still sitting in Russia, um, and in the, in the, so in this fight, America's in, in, been backing, you know, yeah, the most regressive, the the most, I mean, like the, the, basically, America's been backing the people who America was supposed to have been fighting against during World War II. Exactly. You know? I mean, so we have Victory Day today, and uh, you know, uh, May 9th, and the 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 victory over over fascism, over 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 Nazi Germany, right, over fascist Italy. I mean, the groups that are in power today, ideologically, are the see themselves as the direct inheritors of the groups that fought with uh, fascist Italy, that fought with uh, fa fascist Germany against the Soviet Union and against America, right, against the Allies. Uh, and so it's a it's a very strange world where you have you know someone like Senator you know John McCain coming out 
to support uh, the Maidan Revolution 2014. And, you know, the cameras, he's on stage. To his right is actually a guy who founded, who's, uh, who, who, um, who's one of the leading sort of activists or leaders of, of, of a rebranded National Socialist uh, Party of Ukraine called Freedom. That's what they call themselves now. That's he's on, you know to his right on the stage, and then with the camera zooms out, and you you have actual people with um, Nazi symbols and SS s symbols uh, on their on their on their on their uniforms, on their helmets. There are these sort of like lesser known kinds of uh, Nazi um, um, symbols, like the wolf's angel, which is this sort of like uh, a kind of a slightly modified um, version of the swastika. And so, you know, you have John McCain, you know, the freedom fighter, you know, the guy who uh, was, uh, you know, who, who uh, was at some point um, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, um, you know, on stage with not with 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 fascists cheering him on and him supporting them. So that's the kind of stuff. So so America is really backing um, some some really nasty characters, you know, and uh, and a really nasty ultra nationalistic, ultra right wing ideology, which is that Ukraine is a country that's only for Ukrainians, right? That yeah. Ukraine cannot have, um, a Ukraine, which has been historically a, a dual culture, a dual ling language society for, for, for a long, long time, um, where people speak Ukrainian and Russian equally, where some cities are completely Russian. Like you go to Odessa, for instance, or Kharkov, you know, to, these two very, you know, important, largest cities in uh, Ukraine. In the East, and yeah. Yeah, and they speak. I mean, they are. You know, Odessa is a Russian city, and people speak Russian there. Uh, Kharkov is is a, pretty much a Russian city. People speak Russian there, and these are not like even far eastern um, cities. You know, these are these are. You know, Kharkov is the second is the second largest city um, in um, in Ukraine. So you have and where you know you have this very very nationalistic, very uh, ultra right wing kind of idea. People coming to, coming to power after Maidan, and then they pa they pass all these. Really draconian uh, laws and um, that exclude r the Russian-speaking Ukrainians from from public life, where you can't have, you know, for instance, Russian on u menus in in restaurants in, in in Ukraine today. You can so you'll go in there, you'll have like Ukrainian in English, right, on, on a menu, because they'll, they'll translate for the tourists that come there. But you won't have Russian. Yet everyone's speaking Russian in the in the restaurant. The the the, the waiter is speaking Russian. You know, you're with people who, who are you from from Ukraine speaking yeah, Russian. Yeah, even uh, Poroshenko yeah. in a speech, he like couldn't come up with the Ukrainian word for he used, used you know, that he just had spoken Russian for so long that he didn't even know some of the words in Ukrainian yeah. that he was trying to grasp during his speech. Things like that. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, look, it's yeah. People and all the business a, a contracts of, are written in in Russian and things like that. You, yeah, a lot of people. Ukrainian is. People know you, Ukrainian, you know, but you know, what, what's interesting about this, though, it's, 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 it's a weird thing, because I know that in the Soviet Ukraine, you know, um, it, there was, because this, uh, there was even, you know, in Soviet Ukraine, there was, I, I, I have family uh, who is from Ukraine, and uh, sort of extended family, and I know that uh, um, one, one of these people, um, she was a, a kind of a scholar in Russia, but she's from, she's from uh, Eastern Ukraine from a small town, and she went to university in in Kiev, and um, she wanted to do her dissertation on uh, Dostoevsky, and and they were basically she was kind of discriminated against in her in her university because it was it was looked down upon in in, in the Soviet Union because she wasn't doing a dissertation on a on a Ukrainian author, um, mm. that it was it, it, she was doing a dissertation on a Russian author, and and there was so there was you know. You study the study of Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian language is actually encouraged and supported in the Soviet Union because you know there's so it wasn't like it was repressed or anything like that. And in fact, she, oh, you know, okay. she, she talks about it now. She talks about it now, and she's actually very bitter about it because she felt like she was being repressed by these sort of Soviet Ukrainian nationalists. Um, <laughs> so I mean, it, it's a very strange world. You know, the, the nationalism question and sort of the the in, in the Soviet Union is totally confused and contradictory. I mean, it's supposedly it's against nationalism, right? But on the other hand, it puts your nationality, um, which is like a hybrid of uh, your ethnicity and 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 a potential nationality. If you have, if your ethnicity has a country, like you would be Armenian or Ukrainian, right? Uh, in your passport. I mean, this is sort of in your main document that you use to get, to to do anything in the Soviet Union. And 
you know, of course, Jews also got had a nationality. You're Jewish, but you don't have your own country in the Soviet Union. You know, it's so wow. uh, so it's such a it's such a it's like it's it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's it's not logical. So there was so the people were sort of discriminated against or, you know, um, put into boxes based on their nationality. And all, although the Soviet Union was against nationalism, you know, so it's mm -hmm. a, and it supported various different national cultures w within the Soviet republics. Um, so it's a it's a it's a strange thing. Um, so nationalism sort of existed in, in, in the Soviet Union as well to, to a degree. Um, but, you know, the, the, the people that came to power after after Maidan, you know, the, the backed by America, I mean, they are the most. I mean, they espouse a very clear fascist ideology of, of like sort of blood and soil of Ukrainian soil for, you know, Ukra the Ukrainian people and a very narrow definition of what you of what a, a Ukrainian person is. And of course, a Ukrainian person, a Jew cannot be a Ukrainian, a Jew, even though they their family's been in Ukraine for for centuries and for generations, you know, would not be considered a Ukrainian. Right. So uh, and yet the president of Ukraine right now is a Jew. Right. He's Jewish. He is uh, basically a kind of a Russian um, speaking Jewish person, Ukrainian, <laughs> um, and he is the president of of uh, of Ukraine right now. And he won by a landslide by 75 percent of the vote, uh, which is like unheard of in 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 Ukrainian history. But also, I think in most countries, you know, to win by with 75 percent of the vote is is pretty Definitely. spectacular. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, and he and he um, yet he, uh, you know, you know, you know, but yet he like. So he's the president of this extremely nationalistic uh, now political environment, yet he's the president of this thing, and he's Jewish. And he goes out of his way to sort of whitewash and to kind of make peace with a lot of these fascist groups and ultranationalistic groups. And so it's a very strange, it's a totally, I mean, for someone who wants some clear-cut boundaries of you know, who's good, who's bad, and, 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 and right and wrong, I mean, Ukraine is not, not you know, the place the for it, to look for it, no. yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and so, and, when they yeah. when they had these proxies, you know, these uh, fighters who, you know, in some cases they were hired into militias funded by oligarchs and things like that. So at the same time in Syria, we we already knew that there were some really shady characters being recruited into militias that we were backing over there too. And in that case, they were using the excuse, well, well, you know, the uh, the best fighters, the toughest fighters, the most uh, the biggest ideologues who would like fight to the death, uh, you know, happen to be, I don't know, affiliated with Al Qaeda or, or yes. friendly to Al Qaeda. And, and, and they would make the excuse like, yeah, well, we're just like, this is just a temporary thing because we need some good fighters. And so I think I was thinking, all right, well, maybe it makes sense. If that's the case. It was still really difficult to wrap my head around, but I thought, all right, this is just kind of a fluke and it's a temporary thing. And they, they needed some good fighters, and of course, in a coup, you know, it's kind of hard to recruit. Um, so this is this is sort of a novel, temporary thing. And then, I mean, I had already read about uh, like the Devil's Chessboard and things like that, and a little, knew a little bit about the Dulles brothers mm -hmm. and how they were essentially collaborating with the Nazis, and then you know, picking and choosing. Um, you know, the, the, the Nazi in whatever position they were in scientists or whatever else that were useful to them and sort of pulling them out and bringing them over here into other places. And so I thought, so I knew a little bit about that, but what I, what I didn't know is how you have framed the story, which is that, uh, the, and, and I like the way you framed it too, with the, the one guy that you use, um, the Jewish American guy who's over oh, there, Ira, the Ira, Ira Hirschman. Yeah. yeah, Irish Hirschman. It was that was a perfect way to frame it uh, because he he went into this whole thing thinking the war is over. Um, you know, we were allied with the Soviet Union at that point in time, so you know maybe we're not going to be best friends, but at least we can we don't have to go to a war with them. We don't have to be enemies, and we can find some yeah. way to work things out. And everything's going to be good, and everyone's really um, really devastated by the war and they they want peace right and he goes over there and he finds out that uh nah they're already gearing up for the next war and i actually learned a little bit about this too from 
funny how I went through all these years of American history. And I did not know that under Truman, there, you know, a choice was made. The uh, the Soviet Union was at that point in time, you know, really not up for having a Cold War and, and us being an enemy. They expected some kind of to work something out with us too, but no, that's that was never. There was a decision made during the Truman years that we were, you know, we were at war with Russia. And even though the people of America were never quite told that, they were told that slowly and over time as the Cold War developed. But they were already recruiting. They were yes. already. Um, well, I'll, I'll just let you you tell the story. Yeah. I just wanted to sort of segue into that and tell you how just how effective the way you framed that was. I thought that was kind of brilliant the way you did it. I mean, yeah, like I mean, you know. So if you want, you know, part of part of why I um, yeah. I, it took me a while to come to this kind of framing, which you know, immigrants as a weapon. To to look at um, immigrants as, as, and and how immigrant groups, you know, not just just immigrant groups, but also just various different uh, religious uh, sects, um, um, you know, uh, like eth ethnic groups, um, are weaponized by empire, right? Um, and and the and you you kind of look at you look at foreign policy today. Yeah. Uh, you look at any anything, and it, and the stuff just pops out at you. You know, like let's say we, let's if we talk about the pandemic today, which is you know the, both to the Trump administration and the, and the and you know the GOP and sort of the right wing of, of of American society is you know wants to make it all about China, and it's basically you know there's different theories. Some are saying it was developed in a lab as a bioweapon specifically to take you know America out. Other people say it was. And, and that's sort of the right wing side of it. Right. And then, you know, the kind of the liberal answer to that is, well, yeah, it was made by China, but it was not, you know, explicitly designed to 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 attack America, it just leaked accidentally or something, you know, but everyone wants to blame China for this or because, you know, China didn't didn't warn the world fast enough. So it's to blame. So we should ask for reparations or whatever. So there's this, you know, campaign to blame China. And if you actually look at the origins of and who's pushing this and who are the experts that are being um, consulted or who are the kind of the groups that are you know, producing some of this propaganda about the you know Wuhan virus or the you know the China, the CCP virus? And it's actually um, immigrant groups in America from that are from China that are very anti-communist. The one the most prominent one is um, the Falun Gong. Yeah, uh, that's which a is wild sort of, group. Right, oh my right, god, kind of right-wing sect, weird one. But you know, but but any but it's not just China. It's if you know if you look at Syria, Venezuela, Iran. <clears throat> Um, anywhere where like America has a kind of a conflict, conflict with the natives, where the natives aren't submitting in exactly the way that America wants them to, you have you 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 see that there are immigrant groups and groups from those countries that are pushing some kind of narrative that is usually weapon, you know, it's against their co their country or against the government that is currently in power in their countries, and they're very much you know tied in with American power. I mean, of course, you know, Syria is a great example of that. And so, you know, and and Venezuela, so, that's a big one. Venez Venezuela. Yeah. Venezuela is a huge one. Yeah. And it's all these, you know, basically oligarchs that are pissed off um, and that are here and trying to you know, continuously trying to do a coup over there. You reinstall um, them. Yeah. Yeah. And so and so, you know, and so you have these weaponized immigrant groups and they're weaponized. I mean, they're self weaponizing. I mean, or they allow themselves to be weaponized because it fits their uh, own objectives and their own um, sort of uh, their own, you know, what their own power because they think they're going to get some benefit out of this obviously they're not they're not victims in in, in the sense that let's say you know a, a, a migrant laborer you know from let's say you know somewhere in central america who is in america and is being demonized and being weaponized by by the right as you know some kind of foreign enemy that's going to destroy america from the inside right it needs to be sort of kicked out that's sort of a that's a victim kind of weaponization right they're being victimized but these are more privileged groups they are they have a role to play in american empire they're usually Either directly or indirectly funded by some kind of state or uh, intelligence apparatus uh, uh, through nonprofits, through various sort of these kind of intelligence cutouts, through um, different organizations, and so they are a privileged group that uh, weaponize themselves in, on, on, the, on behalf of American empire. Um, and so, you know, it's it's just it's so vast this network of people that you know they go through from all over the world, um, and you know it's hard to understand like okay, how does this all make sense? And so. For me, what I realized is that it all really begins right at the end of World War II. 
And when America found itself as the new empire in the world, you know, the British Empire was basically extinguished or hobbled in a huge way by World War II. Um, and America found itself as, the, the, you know, the main guy, the new kid on the block, and essentially taking over from the, from the British Empire in many ways. And, and at that point, and, and, it's, and, and, it, was, and it's, it was facing this, uh, what a lot of people in America truly believed was an existential fight for survival against the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union won World War II, right? It came out victorious. It was uh, obviously badly wounded and destroyed. But the ideology that underpinned uh, the Soviet Union, communism, was extremely popular, popular in Europe. Um, and it would become popular across Asia, right, and across Latin America. And so they saw this as this sort of, as a, as a virus, you know, as an ideological virus. And that was, you know, created essentially to uh, destroy this kind of Western civilization, the Western you know, uh, sort of free enterprise system. And they saw in Europe, it was spreading, you know, I mean, uh, in, in Italy, you know, communism was just ascendant. I mean, it would have taken power if the CIA hadn't worked to, um, to basically rig the elections and to, and, and to, and to destabilize the political system there, you know, to just to give you one example. And so, so in this fight against the Soviet Union, in this imperial fight against the Soviet Union, um, there were these natural allies in, in, in Europe. And these natural allies were uh, various different ethnicities that that work that came from the Soviet Union that had during the World War II collaborated with Nazi Germany, collaborated with the Nazis, uh, fought against the Soviet Union, and, and and they came from the Soviet Union and the various Soviet republics. And there were thousands of them, tens of thousands. I mean, I mean hundreds of thousands rather. You know, spread across Western uh, Europe and Western Germany pr predominantly, but also in Italy, um, and. You know, sort of American Cold War planners looked at these people and they said, well, these are our natural allies. You know, these are the people that we can work with, that we can use in this coming war against the Soviet Union. And a lot of these wars yeah. so quickly. I mean, no matter what was being said at home, we're anti-fascist and all this stuff. They just flipped to a new war completely before anybody even realized yes. it. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Because it was. No, yeah. They too, flipped, right. Yeah. Kept secret. I mean, yeah, it was, it was, I mean, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't open, but it was, but it was, but it was also not like too secret. I think it was talked about, it's just, it talked about in, you know, people were calling for war. I mean, it, there were different flanks of, of kind of, yeah. uh, there was a sort of the more like sort of appeasement, sort of more like new, new deal liberals and, and a more, and, and, and a kind of an emerging cold war, cold warrior liberal. True. And true, of course yeah. the sort of the, 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 the very far right, um, that was, that, that, um, that was, you know, believed that were. But yeah, but it wasn't like, it wasn't America, stated American foreign policy. Uh, that's out in the open. And so a lot of these groups that America began to work with were, you know, uh, by and large fascist in their outlook, um, classically fascist. Um, uh, they uh, had, um, um, or, or proto-fascist um, in the case of sort of like, let's say white Russians or pro, you know, pro-monarchy pro Ru Russians. Um, and and so uh, what, what emerged, uh, you know, as a kind of as an as a natural evolution of American imperial strategy was that, um, you know, the Soviet Union was this multi-ethnic uh, society. It you know, comprised, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know even now I know how many actual distinct ethnicities uh, existed within the Soviet Union, but it was a huge amount, dozens, right? And each one of those ethnicities represent presented a potential weakness because you know there there were uh, before before. Uh, you know, uh, when the so when when the Russian Empire collapsed, all these different ethnicities—not all of them, but a lot of them—wanted to get their own national independence. Everybody wanted to have their own state. Everybody wanted to have their own national sort of government based on their own, you know, unique eth eth race. You know, as they believed, uh, right? And so you could use those those things as as a way of weakening the Soviet Union. And so began uh, as kind of a long uh, history that we we're still in today. Of America weaponizing nationalism and nationalist movements uh, and uh, nationalist ideology as a as a as, a, as an imperial tool against the Soviet Union, uh, but then of course you know against um, against pretty much you know a lot of other countries that have a, have a mixed a ethnic makeup you know and and you see this in the Middle East very very easily because a lot of these countries are kind of you know, were drawn pretty much randomly by the by the great powers and, 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 and diced up in these crazy ways where you have, you know, like, you know, Kurds spread across three different countries. You have a mixture of different sort of 
uh, Shias and, 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 and Sunni Muslims within one country. And so you can use one group against the other. And if one group is in power, you can use the sort of these emigre groups that, um, that are outside of the country, right? You can sort of use them to try to whip up and try to inflame the uh, part of the population within their, own, their home country, right, as a way of sort of destabilizing the regime. Um, which you see in, you know, Syria, for instance, uh, with, right, uh, with, exactly. the, with, the, with the Sunni versus the Alawa. Yes. And, the, you know, the British Empire did this, uh, of course. Uh, I mean, uh, pretty much all empires did this. But I think, you know, America took it to such a level, uh, especially because the technology allowed it to um, sort of bro- broadcast a lot of this stuff much more effectively. You know, America created this uh, unprecedented uh, propaganda apparatus starting uh, right after World War II. Uh, with these sort of covertly uh, funded CIA uh, by the CIA radio stations, at the time they were known as Radio Liberation and Radio Free Europe, and then it was Radio Free Asia, uh, and they sort of expanded. But they were, um, you know, they employed almost exclusively like the different kind of um, groups, uh, emigre groups from the different nationalities and ethnicities in the Soviet Union. So you had everyone from sort of Chechen, sort of. Uh, Chechen separatists, you know, the early kind of Chechen separatists that wanted to create a Muslim Chechen, you know, um, independent state to Ukrainian fascists to, you know, sort of white uh, Russian monarchists who wanted to create a greater Russia that wouldn't give liberation, uh, liberation to these people, you, to, to actually Jewish socialists, um, to, you know, who wanted uh, who and, and designists and things like that, that, that wanted to agitate and, and inflame the different the, the tensions between all the different ethnic groups in in the Soviet Union. So it began with that and created this massive massive apparatus that was probably the you know I I don't think anything had been undertaken on such a level at that point. I mean just the radio um, just one radio station Radio Liberty that broadcast um, from Germany and from Spain and from Taiwan into the Soviet Union in like in in more than a dozen different languages twenty four hours a day right. Um, just the energy input into its its radio transmitters uh, could power a city of 150,000 people. Yeah, I saw that in there. That's that's just wild. That's crazy. I mean, so so that, and that's just one radio station. And so as time has gone on, um, this apparatus has just only expanded, you know, because the America's empire has grown over since the 1950s, um, and um, and. Um, and it's and, and it, but this 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 origin of the of this apparatus really begins in Munich in 1951 1953 uh, that with the establishment of these radio stations. Um, uh, but but and and that and and w- with that begins a um, a what is it now a 75 year you know history of using um, nationalism. Uh, using uh, religion, using sectarianism as weapons of empire. And so basically setting one group of people against another group of people in order to destabilize the countries and to remove governments and, uh, that you don't like. Um, and um, I mean, and, and, and sort of that's kind of the history of what we're seeing today play out on the world stage. Uh, and, and, and immigrants and uh, people from those groups uh, that live in America or that live in the West are key to this whole thing, are extremely important, and they almost get no, no uh, attention whatsoever. And now you have said that, like, talk, if you would, about your family, you know, immigrating here and, sort, you know, did you get caught up in that, uh, your community? Did you see people, did people even know what was going on or how... How did you figure this all out, I guess? You know, um, you were a young person when you came here. Uh, it had to be kind of bewildering to come settle into a new culture. Uh, yeah. And especially with the, I'm not sure when exactly you came here, where, if the Soviet Union had uh, broken up by then or not. But, like, um, how, um, how do you, yeah. what are some things that you saw or some insights from your own personal experience? So we left um, in um, 1989, um, and so and we spent almost a year, no, like just just under a year, uh, in re- in various refugee camps in Europe. So we we left by train through Poland to Austria, uh, from 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 Leningrad. Uh, back then uh, it was Leningrad, now it's St. Petersburg, uh, and so and then we spent some time in a, in a uh, refugee camp in Austria. 
then we were transferred to a refugee camp um, in Italy. And we lived there for six months until we were sort of uh, granted, uh, you know, uh, like entrance into, into the United States. And then we moved to New York. Uh, and then my dad uh, got a job in San Francisco. And so, you know, his, his new employer relocated us to San Francisco. And so uh, we were in New York for only three months before we went to San Francisco. And I grew up in San Francisco, uh, start, starting, uh, I mean, I started, started going to fourth, fourth grade. So I finished first grade in, in the Soviet Union, and I went to fourth grade here in, in America. That's really um, young. Yeah, really young. Yeah, so I was, I, was, I was nine when I got here. You know, I turned nine while we were in, you know, in, in, I turned nine in a refugee camp in Italy. Uh, so, yeah, I was young, but, it was, but I, re- I remember quite a bit. And, of course, the political aspects of it, I mean, they were, I mean, in, in hindsight, obviously, they're very apparent to me as a nine-year-old kid and really to anybody who is not an adult. And actually, to, to probably many adults, it wasn't really apparent. I mean... They didn't really care. I mean, so there's different, there's a, this, the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet Jews that left, you know, primarily left because, because of economic reasons, because they thought that, you know, there were a lot, there was a lot more opportunity for themselves and, right. and for their children, for their children. And so uh, there was an opening, um, that they, they, they could, they could leave, uh, and they took it. And so there was within that group, uh, there was, you know, slightly segmented. Some people believed more, um, you know, a lot, were a lot more ideological. I mean, they, they, uh, there was a kind of a, starting in the 60s, but particularly in the 70s, uh, with the, there was a growth of a kind of a Jewish um, n- sort of nationalist, national, not even, like a Jewish ethnic re- reawakening in, in the yeah, Soviet Union yeah. am- among, among Soviet Jews, who, because they grew up completely secular, you know, completely just in, in this post-war uh, Soviet society where, Maybe their grandmother spoke Yiddish. Maybe their mom spoke Yiddish a bit, but they were, you know, they grew up. They didn't grow up in this, in in this sort of, uh, in in the Jewish environment uh, of of the Russian Empire, you know, which which their parents grew up in, and their great grand and their great and the grandparents grew up in, which is you know usually a village or very tight knit Jewish communities. They didn't grow up in that. They grew up as just Soviet citizens in the Soviet Union in some big city or in some small city, right? Because everything was a lot more concentrated um, after World War II. You know, everyone moved to the cities. It was this new kind of industrial culture that was being built. And so, but as they grew up, they kind of started, you know, re, re, and, and, Isra- and Israel actually became such an important player on the world stage and had, you know, won its independence and, and just was winning these series of wars. It looked like it was going to kick ass. You know, it's people started being interested in their, in their Jewish culture, you know, in their Jewish identity. And so there was this uh, kind of a Jewish identity identity politics or something that yeah, would begin solidarity to grow up. and yeah but also just also like there was also i think a kind of um a um a chauvinism in a way uh, attached to it because uh, i see yeah be- because it's like you know it's like i'm not like these other soviet people you know like this russian soviet person you know who just sort of comes from this sh- you know sh- shitty backwards country i'm you know i'm special i'm a jew i have this whole like you know f- you know four thousand year history uh, I have a country that's like kicking ass. It's modern. It's you know, it's it's progressive. It's like, you know, uh, it's um, it's 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 exciting. You know, it gives me, it, it makes me stand out. So it's like it's really is almost like a, you know, a, I, I kind of like to refer to it as almost like a proto you know, identity politics or something where you 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 realize that you're this is what the, what's this I, part of your identity is what's important to you and it makes you stand out and you and you, so and the same thing was actually happening almost exactly in parallel in, in America. I mean, American Jews were discovering their um, Jewish identity and were becoming much more Zionist and much more conservative in terms of their foreign politics and were moving away from this working class politics. Right, uh, right. And, 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 and sort of solidarity with working, the working class that their parents and their grandparents had because they came here as working class people. Um, and the sort of this Yiddish culture that existed, it was already had died, you know. So the baby boomer, Cult, uh, generation in America had this Jewish reawakening as well, and so they were kind of in parallel, and they and they actually were you know disconnected from each other, but fed off each other, uh, and so so within my you know the, my my parents um, they are um, um, what they're sixty nine uh, right now, um, and so in, in their in their in their culture in their in their in their in their community of, the, of people who were also wanted to immigrate. I mean, some people were a lot more nationalistic or religious even, you know, they were, they wanted to convert to Judaism or they wanted to practice Judaism and they kind of went kind of into the religious side of it. Other people were a mixture of being basically kind of anti-Soviet because like my dad and my, and my mom, you know, they were discriminated against. My dad wasn't allowed 
basically to uh, you know he 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 passed all the exams and he could go to you know a, a top university, but he was denied because held back, they, right? Because they said that we have enough Jews here, so we have like essentially a quota system, and so he you know it made him bitter about yeah, uh, yeah. about about it, and so he. And he was already, you know, not like a fan of the Soviet Union. So, you know, the, the, these things kind of worked with each other and, um, you know, they fed into each other. And so, um, and he, and he, he's, he's, you know, my dad is brilliant with languages um, and he was always interested in American culture and American music and American literature and all this stuff. And he, he listened to all these right radio yeah. stations. And, and, he, and he listened to all these radio stations. And so he, you know, and he um, correctly guessed that actually for a person like him, there was a lot more opportunity in America and he, he'd be valued a lot more. Um, and so, you know, so there was a mixture of, 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 of ide ideology, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and just sort of economic opportunism or believing that you have more opportunity there. And those things are actually kind of connected. So, and, but, you know, growing up in the Soviet Union and, and I mean, growing up in Russia, uh, I mean, so on, growing up in San Francisco as a Soviet immigrant kid, you know, I didn't really think about this stuff at all. Um, of course, I mean, uh, very few people did or, and pe most people still don't really think about it, um, about how they fit their story or, you know, fit into the larger geopolitical uh, story of America and why they were so privileged uh, as immigrants. You know, I mean, immigrants usually aren't as privileged as we were. You know, we were really supported by, you know, by both uh, parties, you know, Washington, D.C. We were supported by some of the, you know, some very powerful institutions in America. Yeah, we were, very, we were, very valued. Yeah, yeah. We were seen as, you know, we were seen as like um, our our cause was championed by, you know, as a bipartisan um, project, uh, uh, and and so uh, um, we, you know, we get we weren't discriminated against when we got here. You know, we were immediately allowed if you if you needed to and you couldn't get a job, you were immediately allowed to go on welfare and get food stamps and things like that. Which is, you know, that's we, we that was that was actually there was a change in the law that actually. Uh, because we were we were given the status of as political refugees, we were able to immediately sort of claim benefits and, and get on, on you know on welfare to to hold us over while we, while people could get jobs. Um, it wasn't like someone people didn't want to be on welfare necessarily, but you know that's a very generous thing to do. You don't most immigrants don't get that here. In fact, most people you know it's uh, and in fact Soviet Jews of an earlier generation, which my grandfather came from, I'm I'm still not sure. He's actually my step grandfather, but he's the only grandfather I knew. Um, mm. We we now think that he actually came from either the Odessa area or Russia. We're not sure. Well, most but Jews would, would not. Yeah, most Jews would not come from Russia. Russia, like they would come from, they come from the Pale of Settlement. With Russian Jews weren't allowed really to settle in. Um, yeah, and, his last and, name was Shapiro, and yeah. he. Uh, I thought they came from Germany, but now I've learned differently. And um, like I said, I still need to, to find out more about it. But I mean, he I've always been really sympathetic to him. His they lost. So I'm not sure how but they lost their father and the mother with five children made mm -hmm. her way across Europe uh, somehow and, and yeah. got here somehow. And then they used to actually travel. The, he used to travel the country and work as like a mm -hmm. migrant type worker. This would be in the early 19 uh, early 20th century. And um, in his case, you know, so he was here through a lot of the worst anti-Semitism, had to change his name, um, started a business and actually three different times, like was betrayed by some employees at one point, other sickness, like he remade himself three different times. Um, yet he was, you know, uh, enthusiastically American. He was a, you know, World War veteran yeah. and in, in the in the cemetery when we visit, he's the one star in just a sea of crosses. And so I just think, I just think about his life and how, how difficult it was. And like, I don't know, he's kind of a hero to me. So yeah, it's um, a different, so you know, it was different then. Right. So his experience I mean, but also, would have been a lot different. Yeah. A lot different, but I think similar in some ways because he was also an, a, an immigrant of economic, uh, you know, of economic opportunity. Yes, right? So, right, so right. he saw economic opportunity and most Jews, I think that's why you don't see too many Jews from Germany coming, you know, in the early 20th century or late 19th centuries because German Jews are, you know, a lot more, um, uh, a lot more sort of integrated into German society. Uh, they, um, whereas most of the immigrants who came to, to America, the Jewish immigrants, they came from 
be sort of the provinces, you know, there were more backwards places where there wasn't a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of opportunity and there was the depression and, and, and things like that. So, so, I mean, so there's some similarity um, in the sense that all we were, we were all, you know, immigrants of economic opportunity. Yeah. Um, but of course there'll be huge differences. Uh, part, one of the big differences was, was that, I mean, I, I don't, I actually don't know of another kind of immigrant um, that ha was as sort of championed as a Soviet, you know, Jew, you know, immigrant from, from in the late, in the seventies and in, in a certain, in, late 80s. in a certain, certain time frame. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I don't think anybody, I don't think there was anything really, I mean, uh, similar to that. And, uh, of but is now, that even the, is that yeah. the case now? Like, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you know, my son, um, a college friend, Russian family, and um, I haven't talked to them recently, but I could just imagine what they're going through being uh, immigrants from Russia now. You know, they came just would, recently. Um, well, he's a, this kid is uh, be like about 23, and um, I would say his parents came over. So, mm -hmm. um, he's grown up here, but I mean, it's yeah. just, I, I'm just afraid for Russian Americans, the whole Russiagate thing. Although that, that didn't really catch on too much, I guess. I mean, it's, I was, it was just it, it, afraid it, it, they yeah. were going to be demonized, you know? I mean, yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think the, the, obviously the, you know, the, look, it's, it's like, it's the weaponization of immigrants. It just fits so perfectly into the structure, which is that, okay. So on the one hand, you know, when the Soviet Union was still, uh, you know, alive and kicking, the Soviet Jews were, uh, as a, as a as a group, right, was was weaponized by America, um, and and Israel actually as well, because Israel wanted to get all these Jews out of the Soviet Union into Israel to boost to, to, bo Israel. to boast the yeah the popul the population against sort of the you know the Palestinian demographic so called threat. Right. Um, but so they were weaponized in a positive way. And he said like, oh, yeah, Soviet Jews, you know, we have to we have to defend their rights. You know, you know, the Soviet Union is just like Nazi Germany. They're, you know, they're being repressed there. You know, they're one step away from being sent to a, an extermination camp. I mean, this is what people believed in America. I mean, you could see their, you know, their uh, posters and their flags and stuff like that. They would that, that, so, that American Jews carry to rallies in support of Soviet Jews here in, in America in the 70s. I mean, people could equated Nazi Germany with the Soviet Union, which is completely insane you yeah know? Uh, really um and it's the, the only reason that jews really even exist in, in european jews survived uh and uh russian jews survived ukrainian jews survived or belarusian jews survived <laughs> is because of the you know, soviet union they we wouldn't be here i wouldn't be here you know my parents wouldn't have been born um so so it, it is a so bizarre they, contradiction it really it really is the whole situation it, is a bizarre contradiction yeah, yeah it's, it's really messed up and 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 people but people really believed it because that was the ideology right i mean the soviet union and nazi germany were seen as the same because they're both totalitarian states you know they're just you know the veneer is different but in, under underneath it all they're exactly the same you know that's sort of you hear that now still um and people apply that now to china china but you know, so but back, going back to the Soviet Jews, it's like they were weaponized in the positive sense, in the sense that they were like they were held up as these victims, and they we needed to help them, and so you know we need to you know dedicate a lot of resources to them, and everybody supported them, right? Yeah, and whereas, just to say, it's see how great America is in comparison. Kind yes, of we're great, and then of course you weaken the Soviet Union by by kind of robbing it. You know, it's propaganda, obviously, because you weaken it because you, they they're forced to open up in order to quell instability. They're forced to open up their border and essentially have to bow to the demands of, of, of another country, you know, and to open up their border and to let these Jews out. And it, you, you create a real it was a real political problem that the Soviet Union sort of leadership did not know how to deal with. Um, yeah. And so it was effective, you know, on the one hand, you know, bolstering the image of America that Americans have right of their own society as this do gooder. Um, and of, of weakening the, the, the you know, the, the other society that you're at war with. Um, but but uh, you know but with Russia Gate and this whole insane you know 2016 campaign uh, that, you know to to blame uh, Hillary's loss on 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 you know r r the Russians basically not just the Russian government but, but Russians uh, you know all over the world you know it's like you 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 weaponize against again this group right but you do, uh, weaponize it in a, in a negative manner so you weaponize you demonize this group you 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 sort of create this mythical caricature of you know, the Russians and you have all these stories come out about how supposedly Putin is paying all these Russians through the Russian pension system. And all these people are getting, you know, Russian pensioners are getting 
you know, wired money from the from the Russian government, but it's actually not a pension. It's actually, you know, payoff for, you know, meddling operations and stuff like that. You have these t- <laughs> the, the, these crazy things about all these Russians coming to America to, you know, to have babies and have anchor babies. And they're, of course, going to the Trump Tower in, 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 in Florida and in Miami because, you know, oh, of course, right, it's a yeah. connection between Trump and, you know, and, and the Russians is obvious. You know, there they are. There's and don't Instagram forget James, James Clapper said that just your genetics actually yes. made you a threat and dishonest. So, you know, and suddenly, he actually and, said that on TV, right? No, yeah, he said it repeatedly, actually, in multiple things. And, and um, and you know, and so, like, suddenly the, these Russians are no longer R- Russian Jews or Soviet Jews, right, who were victims just a few years ago. Now they're just the Russians because, you know, you don't want to call them Jewish because that, that would, like, that'd be problematic, you know, first of all. You can't do that, right. First of all, you can't say that Jews are genetically geared to metal. Oh, uh, right, that uh, would be a problem, right? <laughs> and so just, it's, but so, and so, you know, you have this These thing where. These rules are complicated, Yasha, yeah, I and mean, they're really know, complicated. You got to keep it in your head, you got to keep it in your head. <laughs> but, you know, so you, you can turn a Russian, so a Soviet Jew is actually, you know, who maybe is even from Ukraine, can be made into a Russian depending on whether or not they support Trump or uh, are support supported Hillary, you know, like it's like it's such a malleable uh, category, like a, a Russian. It could be you could be a Ukrainian, you could be a Jew, you could be an ethnic Russian, you could be actually, you know, um, from Azerbaijan, right? Right, uh, right? Like, but you would be called a Russian if because it, otherwise it just doesn't make any sense. So, so yeah, so it's the weaponization of immigrants on the one hand to um, to to weaponize them as as a way of sort of a geopolitical kind of crowbar against other countries. But also as a way of blaming all of your domestic problems on them, you know, these are these are all parts of this of, of this kind of um, you know a strategy that comes very natural to American society. Um, like in one way, it's a brilliant strategy, but in other ways, it seems to always blow back, you know, too. So, I mean, but blowing back for who? You know, I don't think it's, it's it usually blows back for the people who. You know, for people who don't matter, you know, the the the, the victims of the blowback. You know, it's like yeah, that's uh, a good point. Yeah. You know, it's like. I mean, it has, has like, I don't know, has, has Obama really been, I don't know, uh, uh, I don't know, what, like, what, what, what has Obama's sort of blowback been, I don't know, from, let's say, going along with the Syrian war and, um, or like supporting, you know, Libyan, the Libyan intervention or something like that, and kind of, uh, what, what, what has, what has, what has been the blowback to, to, to him? I mean, yeah, there's been a lot of blowback. Yeah, his godlike status is still somewhat intact anyway. I mean, a lot of these things, there might be terrible, like more terrorist attacks, maybe, you know, there might be um, a more radicalization of, um, I mean, I, you know, for instance, in the, in, in the case of u- supporting Ukrainian um, sort of right wing and fascist movements in, in, in Ukraine, I mean, there is, because Ukraine is such an open, open shop for any kind of fascist or fascist sort of friendly or fascist adjacent uh, move, movement, you know, a lot of people from all over uh, Europe go there, these kind of far right activists or far right fighters uh, go to Ukraine, fight in, are fighting in the front lines in eastern Ukraine. They get training. They kind of like, and they're creating these international networks of far right activists. And so some of the some of the shooters, for instance, the New Zealand uh, shooter um, who shot up a, a, a mosque, right? Uh, he, um, you know, he was either had traveled to Ukraine. It's very murky. You know, that 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 part of the story had never been really been fully explored. Uh, but he gave he, he based based on his, some of his writings, it seemed like he had traveled to Ukraine, and on his gun he actually wrote the names of some you know, Ukrainian fascist activists, and and then had all these Ukrainian fascist symbols that that he that he promoted, and so you you have and and there's also in in America there's stories coming out now almost you know all the time about how these far right far right activists and uh, just you know like disturbed individuals in America. Are have, have gone to Ukraine to fight, have come back, have like you know been pl- engaged in all these different plots uh, to blow shit up, to shoot people. So there is a blowback. You're right in the sense that you you when you work with these groups and you support these movements, there is always going to be a kind of a blowback, um, usually to your own society or to 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 to, to your allies in some in some way. But but then again, you know this blowback is only helps to sort of pro- propagate and, and sort of uh, the, this machine because. Then you can, you know, uh, ex- give have have a reason to increase your, you know, state apparatus in America to hunt for these far right groups, you know, and all these things. So it's like you know, the the blowback. It's like almost like a perpetual mo- motion machine or something. It's like the blowback only 
the blowback only fuels the the cycle, you know, like like with 9-11, you know, is probably yeah, the best example of this. Right. Stuff. It's like the each each blowback only helps justify the, the initial sort of uh, use of force and, 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 and justifies the increase of this use of force and increased intervention. So yeah, I mean, and, and and it's all good for business, you know. Um, it <laughs> means more war, more uh, more 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 weapons, um, bigger budgets, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a really kind of a amoral, really cynical kind of um, so. a, a empire that basically is just like an en- it's like a business engine, right? It's just all about generating revenue for for the various different parts of our. Um, oligarchy that feed off of this vast imperial apparatus um so it's it's pretty dark um yeah, and it, it takes and, a long time to adjust to it too to to, yeah. to be able to believe it but like when i first started listening to you guys back in your like nsfw days i was drawn to the material and to the broadcasts and things like that but i you were so far ahead of me that uh, i just wasn't in a place where first of all did I even know enough about it? But second, I wasn't emotionally ready to accept it yet. You know, it, yeah. this is a this is a process. It takes time to understand, and that cynicism is, you know, sometimes it's put. You know, it it's a turn off. You just think, oh yeah, I can't take any more of that. But the the situation is, it's just the you know the in in your guys' case, you were just so far ahead um, yeah. than I was, and. You know, it like I said, it was also I just wasn't ready to accept what had really happened at that point either. I had to see some things like what happened in Syria, like what happened in Ukraine, yeah. like what's happening here at home. I've already yeah. we've already gone to an hour, and I feel like I've kept you over time. That's but all right. I mean, okay, yeah. I, I wonder yeah. if uh, yeah. I wonder if we could shift to a different topic real quick, because I can't let you go <laughs> until I ask you about you know. Uh, Yasha wrote the book, famous book, Surveillance Valley, was really on to a lot of things that have now come to light. And so I, you were the first thing I thought of when I found that I was going to talk to you is I wanted to talk to you about this contact tracing that is, well, first of all, all this language that it just emerged so early in the pandemic. I was like, wow, you know, I know these guys did some simulations and but it always seems like when there's a big crisis, you know, um, there are a bunch of people who are ready to exploit it. And I feel like the contact tracing thing was already on the books and they were really either just waiting for a situation that would be, uh, you know, that would justify it. Or, you know, in some cases, maybe they even created a situation. Mm-hmm. I'm not even quite sure yet. But what do you what do you think this is all about? And um, if you can sort of fold it into your surveillance valley, the things that you learned there, like what do you think is going on with that? The extended part of this discussion where I ask Yasha, the author of the book Surveillance Valley, the secret military history of the Internet, I ask him for his thoughts on the new contact tracing programs being implemented by governments And this is a separate extra overtime discussion available to patrons. So you can find that on Patreon, patreon.com slash around the empire. And I'm not the best at marketing. It's not my forte, but I will say that it was a very fascinating discussion. And honestly, I was surprised by the way it developed. So that's my tease. And I hope that some of you will subscribe to this podcast uh, to keep it going and to get these kinds of extras and also the full patron-only episodes that are, that are also there. So it's titled Episode 165 Extra, available at Patreon. And now we'll just continue with the wrap-up to the interview where you can find out how to find more of Yasha's work and how to support him. Anything else you want to throw in here before we wrap up? No, it was uh, just a pleasure. Thanks for thanks for having me on. Yeah, and please tell everybody how they can support your work. And you have some documentary work coming out, which I'm excited to, to see when that happens. So let everybody know how to follow you, how to support you. I mean, uh, yeah, I think the best thing you could probably do is uh, just go to uh, yasha.substack.com uh, and just sign up to my newsletter, which is called Immigrants as a Weapon. It's excellent, guys. Go sign up now. Thank you for listening. Special thanks to Yasha Levine. 
Follow Yasha on Twitter at Yasha Levine. Subscribe to his Substack investigative newsletter, Immigrants as a Weapon, and read his book, Surveillance Valley. Also, visit his website, yashalevine.com. Around the Empire podcast, independent media. Your support's really important. Please pitch in at patreon.com slash aroundtheempire or paypal.me slash aroundtheempirepod. There are a lot of ways to find and listen to the audio podcast. Uh, You can find it on any mobile podcast app, on the website, aroundtheempire.com, on Patreon, patreon.com slash aroundtheempire, or on YouTube. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. That's really important. Follow on Twitter, at Around the Empire, and we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.